But first, I am quite desperate to use my clicker. And for, <laughs> oh, for people using, uh, listening to the podcast right now who can't see these pictures, we're going to be very descriptive and also we're going to make a montage that we've plastered across Instagram for all to see. So don't feel left out, it's all going to be fine. So the first picture is going to be this, which is from Only in America. Jesus. <laughs> so this was in Seattle. And this was a really lovely experience for Reggie and I because we had an idea when we were in our early 20s. We were both obsessed with American culture. Again, I guess another sort of working class dream. One day we'll go to America and it will be amazing. That's sort of changed a little bit in more recent years, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but, but we certainly had that feeling and we were obsessed with what American culture meant. And we went to the BBC and said, can we do a road trip around America? And they say yes. <laughs> I mean, commissioning's got like way stricter oh, yeah. in more recent years, but they let us do it. And we had this amazing experience, about six months of on off, going around some really weird and wonderful parts of the United States and, and doing stuff like that. Well, each episode was themed, wasn't it? Mm. So I think that episode there with me with the stupid cape on and the silly sort of just a stupid face, really, uh, is the superhero episode, and the one next to it is the alien episode where we went to Area 51, and Which we I'll sort just of... Which i click to now, so we oh, can put nice. that on oh, the screen. Oh, yeah. there it is, yeah. There we are. This was in a town uh, called Rachel, by the way. It's a town called Rachel, off of the extraterrestrial highway. Oh, yes. Yes, and there's about 80 people that live there, and they all say the same thing, that aliens have been into the cafe to order food. <laughs> so we stayed there overnight. Which is really relaxing. Yeah, uh, and I think we ate there. You got the jump wrong. We ate at the Alien. Do you remember that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Which was amazing and a fantastic pun. Like top points for the pun. Top points for the pun. Um, uh, more than sort of some of the things that we saw and things that we experienced on screen. I think Only in America is unique in a lot of ways because we were making a road trip show uh, for TV. We were two young people driving around America in a silly yellow Mustang, but. We were two young people driving around America in a yellow Mustang. So it was being filmed and we were making a TV show, but I think our friendship, and I remember some of those conversations that we had and some of the private things that you shared with me and some of the things I shared with you for the first time. And we'd known each other for years at that point. In a weird way, we were gifted the ultimate friendship road trip around America and we happened to get paid while we were doing it. Um, and as a result, I sort of came away from that experience knowing that I'd know you forever. Because what we experienced together, personally, in terms of growth, like the boyfriend you had at the time, the things I was going through with my family, the changes that we were experiencing, we were getting, making real money for the first time, all of the things that we were going through, we were sharing in that car on our own, driving from one place to the next. And it was beautiful in a lot of ways. So when I think about Only in America, I don't just think about the TV show. I think about the road trip that we yeah. got and the friendship that we built. Really. I agree. I think there's something to be said for long car journeys. You're sort of forced to talk, especially if someone's driving. It's really rude if the other person's on their phone. And this is before social media anyway. So we were just sat. And it, we did drives that lasted like eight hours. And we would just chat. And I think it's a really, it's a good place to have a good old, you know, it starts off a bit like, how are you? Where are you going on your holidays? All basic stuff. And then you just fall into a deep chat. And it's a really, it was a really lovely experience. And um, I'm, I, I look back at those memories and these pictures all the time. And it was, it was very, very special. Um, another show that many people who have been walking around at the festival this weekend have said to me, oh, I can't wait to see Reggie on the talk. I used to love watching you on Smile. Oh, he was so alert and awake. So this is Reggie in the Smile chair. We used to have to get up at about four in the morning to record this show, no, to do it live, to do this show. There was one time when Reggie drank a lot of Red Bull. Remember that day? I do remember it vividly. All right, so context. We're in our early 20s. Right? We both moved out. I had my first house. And you know, you're young, you're going out, you're having fun. Uh, so I would be out with my friends sometimes and push it a little bit too far. And I remember one night I went out and didn't get a chance to sleep and got home in time, just about enough time for the cab. Jumped in the cab and went straight to the studio. And I thought, right, fix it up, Reg. Fix up. What are you going to do? And I smashed a couple of Red Bulls. And I then went on to host the live show with Fern 
and interviewed people, but I was speaking so You were so freaking out. You were saying to me, I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do, I can't breathe, I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out, my heart's racing, I'm freaking out. Uh, and part of the reason that that here's, was happening... Here's recess, I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out. <laughs> Well, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I've never taken a drug in my life, I don't smoke cigarettes, I don't do any of that stuff. So caffeine... Uh, it's your like, system it's went, speed. what is this? So I was asking people questions and answering them myself during the interviews. <laughs> and it, I was just an absolute mess, but it was brilliant because everybody knew that I'd just burnt the candle and was trying to get away with it, and I really didn't. We made many mistakes like that when we were on TV, when we were younger. Uh, another memory from Only in America is going in the original Batmobile, and I just actually chose that picture because my outfit is so bad, can I we, don't can, have words to describe it. Can we talk about your neckerchief? Because that's Let's a, talk about it. That's Let's talk amazing. about it. That's a feat of fashion. What did I think? Th so what I think my thinking behind that outfit is, Avril Lavigne, but on a chic day. I've gone... I think I quite like Avril Lavigne. I'm going to try that out. I probably quite like Busted as well. <laughs> and, but that neckerchief's nice. Uh, see, this is one of the beautiful things about um, us essentially growing up on screen. Uh, those awkward pictures and those awkward moments that we all have in our teens, those stupid haircuts. I had a moustache and braids for how long? <laughs> I'll never forget, right? So I had cane row and a moustache, right? Right, let me add to this. Go on. Every night before Smile, once a week. Who is it, your sister? Dev's sister. Dev's sister used to braid uh, Dev and Reggie's hair into a new pattern for the show. <laughs> it could be a spiral, could be a crosshatch. You never <laughs> knew what you were going to get on a Sunday. And, <laughs> and the day I thought, all right, it's time to cut this off now. I shaved it off and I was like, I should probably get rid of the tash too. I turned up to Smile and <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> And you went, Reg, you look so much better, oh my God. <laughs> I was like, why didn't you tell me? You're such a bad friend. What the hell? Why didn't Everyone. you tell me about the neckerchief? You could have said, don't wear that on the telly. Well, look, look what I'm wearing. I look like a brown clown. I look <laughs> just as bad. Look at me next to you and what I'm wearing. We were just as pathetic as each other, but we didn't have the knowledge, so it's okay. we can't okay. escape these pictures. Like, they're everywhere. Yeah. They're in our lives, so we just embrace them. No, I, I do, and I make a point of putting them up on social media mm. now because I love looking back because, yes, it's memories for some of the people that follow me and some of the people that have watched us, but also... It's nice to know that we've we've left that in the past, and and well, also appreciate be yeah, of. and appreciate that stage. Yeah. It's a moment gr of we growth. Were, we were trying our best. God sort of. damn it! Yeah. There I am, uh, travelling around <laughs> the states with my neck pillow and Reggie taking pictures of me <laughs> whilst trying to get a peaceful nap. There was very little sleep during this era of our lives, and it was a lot of going back and forwards. Yeah. We were doing Top of the Pops, I guess, at the same time. I remember I got a mini holiday in New York because you did something that made me so excited and you had to do it here in the UK. You had to leave Shooting Only in America to be one of the hosts of uh, Live 8. Yeah. And that was huge, but you were so young. I know, it's it very weird looking back at that. Um, How old were you at the time? Must have been like 22? 23 or something, I guess. And it was... Um, particularly scary but it was it felt quite magical because it was a big um moment i think for the uk to you know everyone sort of stopped and got involved and a huge amount of money was donated and it felt i felt very lucky to be part of that but yeah that was possibly that week whilst you know <laughs> while i was so exhausted yeah a few more quick memories before we get too self-indulgent what are we even doing there what's one of those things called I don't even know. I just saw it on the A-team and felt like a god driving that thing. Yeah. It's basically, for those listening, it's like a boat with a massive fan on the back. Yeah, a big fun boat. And you sit on a weird sort of school plastic chair on yeah. top of it. It's, health and safety was just like not a foot at this decade. I think I insisted on driving as well because I really wanted to channel the tiny little masculinity that I had inside <laughs> me at that point and drive, drive that wearing a vest. Or as my mother would vest. say, a singlet. A singlet. This is the that's the night we spent in that alien town, oh, yeah, that and we horrible. were woken up, uh, I don't know, one in the morning to go and hunt aliens, and we weren't very happy about it, as you can see by the flaring nostrils. For me, that's just my natural resting face. <laughs> but we, were, we weren't very happy about it. And I think this is the last picture, and I just got this, I found this the other day, and I'd forgotten all about this memory. This is, is very, this is John, John Kerry. <laughs> we should never have been anywhere near John Kerry, but we ended up at NASA watching a rocket launch and we got up at three in the morning and waited at NASA for the 11 a.m. takeoff but you have to get to NASA really early because of the security or whatever 
So we waited for like hours and hours. We're freezing and then we're boiling and we're starving, whatever. Then there's an announcement that one of the rocket boosters, I've made that up, I don't know what it was, had broken and it wouldn't take off that day. Can you come back and do that all again tomorrow? <laughs> yes. So anyway, at this point, John Kerry rocks up to do like a proper announcement. Do you remember this? Can I tell the story? <laughs> and we were like, oh my God, like he's a really important guy. This is crazy. We shouldn't be this close to him. And no one seemed to be sort of going, can you please step away from John Kerry? So I went, Reg, go and ask a question, ask a question, ask a question. And Reggie went, John, what's your favourite flavour crisps? <laughs> we shouldn't have been allowed in there. It was outrageous. But I saw that picture and I, I cried with laughter. It was a very, very funny moment. We shouldn't have been allowed anywhere. We're idiots. We're idiots. We still are. We idiots. still are. Um, that was just a nice moment for us to look yeah. back at some of the many moments that we've had. Good times on TV and doing some yeah. lovely things together. And we've had lovely m moments in our friendship as well. Some of those pictures were not appropriate to show here today. Yeah. Um, but I, I really, um, uh, as a friend, intrigued as to when you felt some sort of inner shift where you knew that the sort of programming you were making, as much uh, as you enjoyed all of that and as much fun and growth as we all had, why and when you felt something inside shifting to move you into the, the area that you're in now? Uh, it's lots of different uh, moments, but it sort of all came to a head when um, a friend of mine pulled me to one side and said, you've got an incredible platform, use it. Now at this point I was, um, I was hosting The Voice and I think I'm the first uh, well, I was the first at that point, uh, young black guy to host a Saturday night primetime show on British television, which is insane it's when you think about ridiculous. it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> no, thank you, but that's not an achievement. It's mm. actually a damn shame. It so is. I appreciate the applause, but it's actually a damn shame, if mm. I'm completely honest with you. And uh, when I had several people who looked like my mum say to me, do something with this, yeah. use this. You've got more ears than you've ever had before. You've got more attention than anyone that looks like you has ever had in this country. What are you gonna do with it? What are you gonna do with it? And um, it was Danny Cohen, um, who uh, used to run BBC One and then he ran BBC Three, who pulled me to one side and executive at the Beeb. And he told me that he really wanted me to make some factual programming. So as part of Comic Relief, I went away to Kenya and I made a film with Lenny Henry, Angela Ripper, and a few a other people. wonderful bit of TV. Yeah, when we lived in a slum for seven days, and um, I came back more tired than I've ever been, more broken than I've ever been, but more elevated than I've ever been in terms of my own personal growth and development. And I didn't know that TV can develop you. I didn't know that an experience you have on camera can change you forever. Mm. And um, you know me, I've always loved shoes. I've always loved sneakers. At that point, I had a house in Highbury. It's two bedroom. The first bedroom, when you walked into the house, on the left was just shoes. At that point, I had about 3,000 pairs of sneakers. It was 3, stupid. 3,000? Yeah, 3,000. I shit you not. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is a problem for me. And again, it sounds really gratuitous, but if you unpick it a little bit, this is a kid who had one pair of sneakers and would make them last two years. Yeah. So, I had really bad feet because I would have to make everything last. And so the minute you're on TV and you start to get free stuff and it's every brand that you've idolized as a kid, you take everything. So I was taking every free pair of shoes I could get and I was buying every pair of shoes that I liked because I could suddenly. There was no cap on what I could get. And you know, working class kid from North London, I'm not thinking about Gucci, I'm thinking about Nike. And that was what I cared about. So I ended up having this room full of shoes. Anyway, I'll try and make this point as quickly as possible. Uh, I'd been living in this slum for seven days, making this documentary. I got home. First thing I saw was this disgusting room full of consumerism. And I had my first panic attack. And I didn't quite know what to do. And that night I called this company that shipped clothes from the UK to Africa and I told them, go in, fill up your van, take whatever you want. And they just took two and a half thousand pairs of shoes. That's all they could take, which is a lot, but they took three quarter, three, uh, two thirds of what I had. And um, I realized in that moment that what I did on screen changed me forever. Mm. And I knew that I needed to do more. And then when Danny said to me, I want you to do more TV, I want you to do more factual TV, uh, I said to him, but I'm not an expert in anything. I'm not right for this. Uh, and I went on and had this massive sort of monologue as to why I'm not right. 
I said, you know, I, I've not got a degree. I never went to university. I'm not an expert in anything in particular. Why will anyone listen to me? And he said, all of the reasons you've given as to why you're not right to make Factual mm -hmm. is exactly why you should make it. Yeah. Because you are the audience. And that sort of changed something in my mind between that conversation and the conversations I was having with strangers who were telling me to do something of value suddenly made entertainment make no sense. Yeah. And I have nothing against anybody that wants to do it, but for me and for my experience and the journey that I've been on, the ears that I have now and the eyes that I have, for me to not use that in a way that can actually affect change in a positive and healthy way would be a huge waste.